We've been talking about the heart of God, and I want to just continue tonight because I, I have a few things to say, and, and I want to be able to hopefully get through everything. But we've learned uh, over the past several weeks that the heart of God is, is, is what I believe the Lord wants us to get close to. Amen. He wants us to be close to his heart. He wants us to know him in relationship. You know, the same way that, you know, you may have a, a, a great best friend or, or a parent, you know, a confidant, somebody that you trust, somebody that you love. You know, you can be so close to that individual that you, you know their heart, you know their feelings, you know their thoughts, amen. You know when they're in a good mood and you know when they're maybe in a not so good of a mood, amen. You can kind of read their heart and you can know what, what it is that they are they're desiring that they're wanting. And I believe the Lord wants us to be so close to his heart. Uh, in the first part of this message, you know, I talked to you about how the, the heart of God is in a father. Amen. And we have to understand that, that the Lord desires so much for, for us. Uh, how many of you are saved? Raise your hand if you've given your heart to Jesus. Amen. Listen, if you're saved, that's the most awesome thing in the world. Because you are a son and a daughter of the Most High God. Amen. That means we have a father, we have a heavenly father that is our defender, our protector, our healer, our strength, our provider. He provides so many things for us. And the Lord is, is wonderful. And the Lord gives us this place of relationship that we can have with him in closeness. Amen? He's not far away. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know how close you were to your earthly father. Maybe some of you just said hi and bye because dad was up early and he was working late, you know, every night. But we have a heavenly father church that allows us to get as close as we want. Amen? You can get as close as you want. You can, you can press in more and more. You can seek him more and more. You can, you can desire him more and more. And he's of unlimited, endless supply. It's so wonderful that, that we can press into the Lord in a beautiful way and have access to him, amen, and, and so we've been learning things about his heart and, and what it is that I believe moves the heart of God, what it is that the heart of God is, is, is focused on, amen, we learned that the, the heart of God is always focused on his will, amen, he's not ever, you know, like preoccupied like us, how many of you ever get sidetracked, raise your hand if you get sidetracked, I mean, it's like you're like focused on this one thing and then you're like, oh, I got to do the dishes, you know, and then it's like you just start doing the dishes, and then it's like you finish doing the dishes like, oh, man, I better sweep. But then you forgot the first thing that you started to do. We get sidetracked. The Lord never gets sidetracked. Amen? There's things that we need to know about the Lord that, that he doesn't operate the way that we do. And so sometimes we want to put God in this box like that we could comprehend, that we could fathom the way he operates and works. But his kingdom, how many of you know, is completely different than this earthly world that you are living in. God is not subject to our logic. God is not subject to our understanding. He is not, you know, limited in, 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 in a way where it's like, oh, if I can understand everything about God. One of the most awesome verses that kind of helped me in my walk with the Lord was Deuteronomy 29, 29. Anybody know it? I'm going to give you a chance. If somebody want to look it up, go ahead. We should know this one. The what? Somebody got it? Who's got it? Raise your hand. First, first person, I'll, I'll let you read it. Deuteronomy 29, 29. You have it? Yeah? You, you just want to read it real quick? <laughs> She's like, she found a way out. Thanks, guys, in the back. <laughs> All right, everybody read it with me. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. I'll read the first line one more time. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. What does that mean? That means that there's things that God knows that you'll never know. Not because God's hiding it from us, but because you don't have the capacity to even understand. Amen? Amen? That's what makes him God. Amen. That's what makes us limited, finite. We're, we're mortal beings, right? We're, we're just normal. But the secret things belong to the Lord our God. That means that you will inherit heaven one day, and there's things that you will, you can pray, God, why did this happen, God? Why? And this and that. And hey, the secret things belong to the Lord. 
It brings us a lot of relief. It brings us a lot of peace. But I want to get into tonight's message because I believe that the, the heart of God is also this. The heart of God defends and the heart of God protects. Write that down. The heart of God is our defender and the heart of God is our protector. Have you ever needed a defender? Have you ever needed a defender or a protector? Amen. I don't know about you, but, you know, you know, I'm not just talking about like a big brother, or, you, you know, or, or your big, strong, you know, dad. But I'm talking about a father, a heavenly father who is unfazed by the circumstances that we go through in this life. Much better defender, amen, than anyone that we could ever have in this world. One who is infinitely bigger than any giant that you could ever face. I want a protector like that, amen? Because no matter how big the giant is here on this earth, God is bigger, Amen? No matter how big the problem is that I face in this world, the Lord is much greater. Amen? And so it's important that in an area of protection and safety and defense that we rely only on God and not ourselves. Amen? That we place all of our trust in him as our defender. Because how many of you know that sometimes we can be quick to take matters into our own hands? Has anybody ever gone, done that, right? You know, we make that mistake sometimes of, of being quick to, you know what, it's like, you know, that song that we were talking about right now, you know, it said, you know, to stay still. Sometimes we don't want to stay still. It's like, God, you know, I, I want this blessing. God, I want this thing. God, I want you to operate in my life in this certain way. And God's going like, stay still. Stay still. I'm fighting for you. Hang on a sec. I'll never forget my grandpa, uh, Lord rest his soul. One of the only things my, my, my grandpa from my mom's side, my mom's here, so she knows this story, but one of, the, one of the only things I remember my grandpa telling me when I was a kid was this. He spoke Spanish, so he was only Spanish-speaking, and I only came down to visit him a handful of times because we you know, lived in Idaho. We lived real far away. One day, my grandpa was at the sink, and he's washing his hands, and he's there you know, just you know, doing his thing, and and, you know, my grandma used to keep the trash can right under the, you know, the sink, right? The cabinet under the sink. So I'm standing there, and I got, like, my plate, you know, of whatever, something I needed to throw away. And I'm like, excuse me, Grandpa. That's 10-year-old Duke, by the way. Excuse me, Grandpa. And this guy's just, like, acting like he doesn't even hear me. Like, excuse me, Grandpa. Nothing. This man is completely not moving. It's like, it's like I'm a fly. I'm not existent. You know, like he, he, I'm out of sight, out of mind. He has no idea that I'm there. I'm like, excuse me, Grandpa. And he goes, wait. I never heard my grandpa utter a word of English in his life. But he knew what wait meant. And he told me it. And it's funny because it's like the Lord is like, not like that. <laughs> God, like I said, God bless my grandpa, but. The Lord sometimes, I believe, would want us to stay still. But he's not as urgent, maybe, as that. He just does some kind of, sometimes it seems as if he's not paying attention, as if he's not listening, but he hears, yeah. right? It's not that, it's not that he, he's, he's, you know, completely unaware, like, oh, there you are. You know, I was looking for you. No, he, he's completely aware of your situation. He knows all those things, but he's also asking you to be still. Amen. He's saying, be still and trust me. Wait on my hand to move. Wait for when it is that I will bring the victory into your life. Amen. And sometimes we're quick to take matters into our own hands when it comes to defending our name or our testimony. You see, somebody said something about you and you, you're eager to just, no, 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 hang on a second. Hang on a second. No, 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 sister, that's not how it went. No, 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 brother, that's, that's not how it went. No, no, no. And we, we want to jump in and we want to take matters into our own hand. And dare I say that many of us have made mistakes defending ourselves before others. Because though we try to justify ourselves or defend ourselves, the model presented to us through the life of Jesus would show us otherwise. Pastor Soto said it so well a few weeks ago when he was talking, and he said this. <clears throat> he was talking about not operating like the world does. You see, sometimes when somebody does something to you, you want to react the way the world would respond to the situation. Amen? 
Our flesh wants to rise up. Our flesh wants to react in a worldly way. And, and, and when someone attacks another person in this world, then we'll just do the exact same in return. Because that's what we see. Right? That's what, that's what we know. If it was verbal, we'll talk right back to that person. If it was a physical attack, we'll put up our dukes and we will fight back. But Jesus would want us to, first of all, take from his example. In 1 Peter 2 and 23, it reads about the Lord, and it says this. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. That's a good example. Amen? Is that like the world? No, not, not at all. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. To him who judges justly. My friend, God will defend you. Amen. God will defend you. God didn't let Jesus go through agony without resurrecting him. And there might be a season of trial or pain or whatever it is that you could be going through, but he will reward you for trusting in him greater than trusting in your own means, greater than trusting in yourself. You see, a Christian, A.W. Tozer said this, a Christian should put away all defense and make no attempt to excuse himself either in his own eyes or before the Lord. He said this, whoever defends himself will have himself for his defense, and he will have no other. But let him come defenseless before the Lord, and he will have for his defender no less than God himself. Amen? In Matthew 26, he told Peter, he said, if you trust in the sword, you will die by the sword. Remember when he cut off that, that soldier's ear? He says, Peter, if, 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 if you trust in that sword, Peter, if you think that's the way that you're going to get things done, if you think that's the way that you're going to manipulate situations to work in your favor, Peter, be careful, because by that sword you will die. The very same way. If you trust in your own voice to defend yourself, you'll die by the words of hurt, criticism, jealousy, and gossip of others. And so God alone, my friends, is trustworthy. Amen? Jesus prayed for you and I, and he said this in John 17, verse 11. He said, I will remain in the world no longer. He said, but they are still in the world. He said, and I'm coming to you. He said, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name. He said, the name that you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. And he said, and while I was with them, I protected them and I kept them safe by the name that you gave me. He said, none has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. You see, we can see through these scriptures that the heart of God is to protect his people. Amen. But more specifically, his protection comes through his name, which was the name given to his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So write this down. His name protects. His name protects. Jesus protects. Proverbs 18 and verse 10 says, The name of the Lord is a fortified tower. It says, The righteous run to it and they are safe. Think of that. The name of the Lord is a fortified tower tower and the righteous run to it and are safe it says the righteous run to him and are safe this is emphasizing you know more about who should run to the lord because we know him amen this is what it's saying it's not saying that that you know it's only the righteous that can run to the lord and find safety no what it's actually saying is it's is it's implying and emphasizing who should run to the lord how many of you have ever had the lord just do something miraculous in your life raise your hand if you're saved then you should have your hand raised because that's a miracle in and of itself amen how many of you have experienced a financial miracle where God just provided supernaturally raise your hand amen how many of you have experienced maybe you know the Lord healing your body in some kind of way maybe it's mentally physically you know what have you amen how many of you have seen God answer your prayers when you prayed for a loved one or you prayed for somebody to come to, to Christ, right? Like we've seen the Lord do all of these things. And, and, and I want us to kind of just emphasize this. It says the righteous run to him and are safe. 
Can I get after us just for a second tonight? Why is it that sometimes we run everywhere else but to him? Sometimes, even after all of the things that we just said, the miracle of salvation, the healing in our body, the provision that we've seen the Lord do, the prayers that he's answered, sometimes he's the last one that we run to. And I want to remind us, how are we made righteous? Let's just cover that just for one second. How are we made righteous? It's through faith in who? In Jesus. Amen? It's through faith and faith alone in Jesus Christ. But I want us to see what it is that the Lord provides for us. His name is a fortified tower. A fortified tower is a tower that is described here. It's a place of high safety. It's not just, you know, like a regular tower. No, no, no. This thing is well built, okay? This isn't like a, what was the nursery rhyme? Like the three little pigs, you know, it's not that. You know, the built a house out of straw or whatever that was. No, 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 my friend. This is like a stone fortified tower. It's got like, you know, concrete and bricks and, you know, all of the, the tough things that you could ever think of. This is what it's made out of. If you could just imagine it, it's a place of high safety. It's built with strong, impenetrable walls. It's secure. It's able to defend, you know, damage from arrows or spears. And it gives the defended person a vantage point above their enemy. So when it says this, that the name of the Lord is a fortified tower, the name of Jesus, my friend, provides everything that you will ever need to defend and protect your life. You don't have to go somewhere else. You don't have to barricade yourself, you know, and hide, you know, behind your weaponry or hide behind other people or hide behind some facade. No, my friend, you can simply run to Jesus because he is our fortified tower. Amen. His name is more powerful than your worst enemy. Amen. His name is greater than your worst sickness. Amen. His name is a place of refuge and we can run to him and the person of Jesus and find safety from our enemies and from our oppressors. I'm reminded of that story. Remember when Jesus protected the disciples in the storm? They go out and the Bible says that they were, you know, they were going to cross, you know, to the other side of of the sea, and so they, they set out in their in their in their in their boat, and they 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 make way towards the other side of the lake, and and the the story goes that there was this this huge storm that the Bible calls it a squall, but it was just this furious storm. Just imagine the rain and the lightning and the and the wind, and you know this little boat was was probably just going crazy. Now I don't know about you, but you know I get seasick. <laughs> you know if you get on a boat, you know you get me on a boat, and it's like doing that thing, yeah. Forget it. Just take me to heaven, Jesus, because I ain't going to survive. But the disciples, they're trained fishermen. These guys know how to navigate waters. They know how to navigate the sea. And yet this thing was so strong that even they were afraid. Amen? They're scared out of their mind. They don't even know what's going on. And Jesus is asleep in the stern of the boat. And they're panicking. They don't know what to do. And they literally begin to say this. They said, do you even care, Jesus, that we're going to drown? Do you even, like, is it even going through your mind? Because I, I can see that you're sleeping peacefully. <laughs> Great time to take a nap, Lord. You see, when you have your enemies bearing down on you, when you have sickness bearing down on you, when you have circumstances bearing down on you, we get real impatient real quick and we begin to accuse God. Do you even care? Come on, God, you see what my need is. Come on, God, you know my thoughts. Come on, come on, and we're, we're urging the Lord. We're, we're saying, God, wake up. And they told this to Jesus. They said, do you even care that we could drown? And Jesus, with the authority of his name, amen. With the authority of his name, he speaks to the storm, and he commands it to be still. And guess what happened? It was still. Jesus can turn any raging storm into a sea of glass. He is the only one who has the ability and the authority from heaven to do this. But then he addresses his disciples and he said this. He said, why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? He's like, oh, ye of little faith. Do you still have no faith? 
And isn't that like us from time to time? Like we go through so many things. We see the Lord do the most awesome, miraculous things in our life. And then the next thing that hits, it's like, oh. Our faith is just like, where's our faith? Oh, ye of little faith. I can testify the Lord has done countless things in my, in, in my personal life up until this point. I mean, I've seen God just do thing after thing. I could tell you testimonies and, and stories that will blow your mind. God has, has, man, you know, told me to give away my drum set, and I gave away my drum set. He blessed me with a new drum set and then gave me the drummer that learned on the drum set like five years later in my youth ministry. I had an offer for an old truck that I used to have, you know, and, and uh, the guy wanted to give me like $2,900. And, and then some other guy calls me up and he says, what's the least you wanted? I said, well, the least I wanted was, was $4,000. He goes, you have the title? I said, yeah, I got the title. He says, meet me at your house in 15 minutes with the title. I'll give you 5000 cash. I don't know about you, but if somebody says the least I wanted was this amount, they're going to offer you less than that. Amen? I don't know about anybody else giving you an extra $1,000, but my prayer the night before, listen to me carefully. This is the God honest truth. My prayer the night before on a Wednesday night after service, I was the youth pastor at the time. I prayed. I said, Lord, and I was about to get married, so this was a real serious prayer. <laughs> I was engaged with Mandy at the time. and I was like, Lord, you know I need this money, God. You know, you know my situation, but I had told the Lord I wanted to give a thousand dollar seed this was something that the Lord stirred in my heart I said Lord I want to give you a thousand dollars and it was just to be sown as an offering so that the Lord could bless the finances of my marriage and I tell this guy the least I want is four thousand he says meet me at your house and I'll give you five thousand God blew my mind. I said, Lord, I got the 4,000 that you wanted me to have. And God, you gave me the 1,000 that I could hand right back to you. And yet, even after miracle after miracle, I could tell you more. I could bore you to death with testimonies. And I know they won't bore you. But I could go on and on about how the Lord's done the same things in your life. And yet sometimes we go, can you? Can you? Really? Are you awake? Do you even know if I'm drowning, Lord? I heard it said this way. You only have authority over the storms of life that you can sleep through. What does that mean? What does that mean? That means that if the storm keeps you awake, it's because you forgot who's in your boat. If that problem keeps tormenting you at night, if that situation keeps just going on in your heart and in your mind over and over, it's because you forgot who's actually in your boat. Amen. Jesus, my friends, is in your boat. Amen. Turn to your neighbor tonight and say, his name protects me. Say, his name goes with me. Say, his name is my authority. Amen. Another example is this. You can keep repeating if you want. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> see, how, see, how, see how we can keep, uh, keep up tonight. Another example of the Lord being our defender is this. Is Jesus one time drew the line in the sand as a sign of physical protection over this adulterous woman. Now, many of you might know the story, but the Pharisees, they were thirsty for blood and they were ready to stone this woman alive because her adultery was punishable for both parties who committed the act. So this was the Jewish law at that time. If somebody had committed adultery, both, both par parties, the man and the woman, could be punish punished by being stoned to death. And so they, they're always trying to, you know, catch Jesus. They were always trying to caused Jesus to trip up in some way. And so Jesus is next to this woman. And so they reminded Jesus of the Mosaic law and they demanded that she be stoned to death. And they asked him this. They said, what do you have to say in regards to this? Now, anytime you ask Jesus a question, you better get ready to have your mind blown. 
Because when Jesus answers questions, I mean, he's just like, you know, in Jesus-like fashion, he delivers the most epic answer. And he said this. He, He said, let any one of you who is without sin be the first one to throw a stone at her. They're all trying to pin something on him. He's like, okay. Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. And the Bible says that one by one, they began to drop their rocks and walk away. Now, what's interesting about this encounter is that they had the right to stone her, but they couldn't because she was with Jesus, the one who is without sin. The one who is without sin. Did you know, my friend, that his name justifies our sin? His name, his blood, his life justifies our sin. Another way that the Lord protects us is this, is God protects what you hear, amen? God protects what we hear. Not only does he he defend us in, in a physical sense, but the Lord protects what we hear. Psalms 32 verse seven says this, you are my hiding place, And you will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Another version says this. It mentions the phrases shouts of deliverance. Songs of deliverance or shouts of deliverance. What is that? I believe it's God is providing a way to safety by two means. To either, number one, for us to pick up the song in his heart that he is singing over us or by us tuning into the shouts of the Holy Spirit providing a way out. There was countless times where Jesus was doing ministry and he was, he was out amongst the people and he would, you know, pray for somebody and they were healed and he'd pray for somebody else and they were delivered, you know, from sin or, or demonic oppression. And the Bible says that they plotted to kill him. And what's interesting to me is that Jesus was so in tune with the Father is that he always knew the way out. He had an escape route. Like, I don't even know how that's planned. But if you're listening to the songs of deliverance, you will find your way out, my friend. You will find the way out. You'll be like, hey, you know what? I feel like I'm trapped. And all of a sudden, the Lord gives you a song of deliverance. It's literally like a pathway so that you can escape. It is a passageway so that you can find your way out. But the only way this is achieved, my friend, is this, is when he has become your hiding place. Amen? It's when he has become your hiding place because you'll never pick up on the songs or the shouts of deliverance if you're not hiding in him. If you're not hiding in him. What does hiding in the Lord look like? It's reading his word. Amen? That's hiding yourself in the Lord. It's spending time with the Lord in prayer. Amen? It's worshiping him, amen. It's meditating on what the Lord has said. It's meditating and even recalling what the Lord has done for your life. It's not seeking your own way out to deliverance. It's not trying to find the answer within our own self or our own abilities, but it's knowing in him. It's finding and hiding ourselves in him. You will find protection, my friend, when you hide yourself in the Lord. Even if I cannot comprehend the answer, the Lord will provide a way out. He always does. You know, uh, you know I don't know if you remember, uh, how many of you guys remember playing tag? Did anybody play tag when you were a kid? Yeah, man, like, we should play tag right now. Let's get this place all crazy. Some of you are like, really? <laughs> you know, like, I'm, hey, I'm still kind of fast. My knees crack, but I can run. All right, so... Watch out, I'm not the easiest guy to tag anymore. But do you remember in tag, there was this thing where you had uh, like a base, right? Like, you know, some versions of tag. There was different ones, right? But there was like the base. And usually the base was like, you know, a tree in somebody's yard. That was the base, right? Like if you were at base, they couldn't tag you, right? So when you were like absolutely drenched in sweat and you're exhausted, like you ran back to the base and you're like, "Ah, you can't touch me. You know, like, and so you, you, you wouldn't let anybody touch you because you were at base, right? Like, like, I remember that. You know, I was good at finding base. But here's a life hack that I want us to understand. Here's a life hack to tag in our walk with God and that's fail-proof. And that's this, is never leave the base. Amen. Never leave the base. You will never lose. You will never be it if you never leave the base. What's my point? God is the base. He is our hiding place. 
We'll always have refuge if we never leave the base. Why do we leave the base, man? There's no rule. I play tag a lot. Nobody ever told me that I couldn't leave the base. I just never figured it out until I wrote this message. <laughs> Thank you, God, for revelation like 40 years later, you know. Because <laughs> I could have really used it sometimes. I could have really used that, you know, in, in, in that game. But the Lord is our hiding place, church. And we are supposed to, to, to know that, you know what, when we're afraid, because that's what you do. That's why you go to a hiding place is because you're usually afraid of something. It's like, oh, I'm going to go to my hiding place because, you know, there's something going on out there and, and I don't want to see that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go inside. We have the ability to come close into the Lord so that he becomes our shelter, our protection. He becomes our hiding place. Amen. Let's keep on moving. The Lord protects us also by being an advocate. Write that down. This is all part of God's defense over our life, all part of his protection over our life. He protects us by being an advocate. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1 says this, But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. It says he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. So 1 John 2 and 1, it's referring to Christ, and, 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 and it's defining that word advocate. Advocate, it means this. It means one who speaks on our, in our defense. One who speaks in our defense. You see, you don't have to speak for yourself because we have one who speaks in our defense. Amen? And this passage is speaking of Jesus as our continuing advocate with the Father. Because how many of you know that we are sinful? Amen? We're sinful. We're valuable people. And because we are sinful, we find in him and only in Jesus as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And thus we have acceptance with the Father. So Jesus stands in the courtroom of heaven and Jesus is, is literally like your eternity, attorney rather. He's your representative. He stands before the Father and he speaks on our behalf. We don't have to go up there and defend ourselves and be like, Hi, Father. <laughs> I was terrible. No, 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 my friend. If you trust in Jesus, the Bible says that his sacrifice is what washes you clean. His life, his blood is what purifies us. And Jesus is our advocate. His defense will take you from serving life in the torment of hell to getting you free without bond. His ability to be that advocate, that attorney on your behalf will set us free if we would just trust in the Lord. Amen? Amen. The other way that he protects us as an advocate is by the Holy Spirit. Amen? John 14, 26. Let's keep going. He says, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. See, victory in, in your life with Jesus begins with the one who we are taught by. Amen? Victory in your walk with the Lord begins with the one who we are taught by. If we're simply reliant on man's wisdom and knowledge, only by that measure can we increase. But if we are taught by the Holy Spirit and we are reminded by the Holy Spirit, then he will always keep us in line with the will of God. Amen? And this is, this is, this is protection. You see, it's another form of protection because if, if I know the will of God, if I, if I know what the Lord is saying about a given situation, if the Holy Spirit reminds me of something that I need to do or, or, or something that I need to act upon, he is keeping me in line with the will of God, which protects me. Because the moment I'm outside of the will of God, my friend, it's like a sheep being outside of his pasture. The shepherd is, is, is here and the sheep has wandered off where into a dangerous wilderness. And I'm thankful that we have a good shepherd, amen? That he'll chase us down. But you know what? I'm more thankful that he gave us the answer from the get-go so that we don't have to wander off. 
We don't have to follow our own ways. We don't have to follow our own mind, our own leading, our, you know, us leading ourselves. But we have the Holy Spirit who will teach us and who will lead us. Amen. Also, let's keep on going. God protects us by what we see. Write that down. God protects us by what we see. I believe that there are times where the Lord hides our eyes to protect you from what you might see. I'm immediately reminded of Moses hiding his face from the Lord because his glory would pass by and it would cause him to die. That's protection. <laughs> Amen. God told him, he said, hide your face. You look at me and my glory is too much for you to contain, Moses. It's too brilliant, it's too wonderful, it's too majestic. It'll, it will kill you. You won't survive it. Psalms 27 and verse 1 says this. The Lord is my light and my salvation. He says, whom shall I fear? It says, the Lord is the stronghold of my life. And of whom shall I be afraid? It says, when the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. It says, and though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. It says, though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. Now I want us to read the first part of that scripture again. It says, the Lord is my light. Everybody say light. light. See, sometimes we need to just stare into the glory of God. Sometimes we need to just fix our gaze on the Lord because he is so magnificent. How many of you have ever been blinded by a light? Raise your hand. Like, you know, you, you've, you know somebody buys a new flashlight, and what's the first thing they do? Oh, you know, it's like, hey, man, check it out. <laughs> is it hurt? You know, like, I don't know why guys are like that. It's like, it's like we want to, like, make each other lose eyesight, you know, by, like, you know, testing out flashlights on each other. It's like, hey, man, check out this new flashlight. You go, boom, you know, but what's interesting about when that happens is, is how many of you have ever had that happen? You know, or somebody was driving down the road and they had those real bright headlights. When you have light that is so powerful shine into your light, it causes fogginess, right? It almost causes like a, like a blindness. But I was thinking about this thought and, and it came to me like this. I believe this happened to David when he was writing this down. What do I mean? I believe this happened when he said, whom shall I fear? David looked into the glory of God. He saw the light and the salvation of God. And then he said, whom shall I fear? Right? He stared into the glory of God, into the most powerful presence of the Lord. And he came out thinking, whom shall I be afraid of? What do I have to be afraid of? He, he fixes his eyes on the Lord and he, he looks at it and he becomes so confident that God's light was able to cancel out the darkness that would advance against him that he had that revelation of saying, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Think about that just for a second. He's like, God, I am looking at you, and I'm feasting with you. I'm adoring you, Lord. I'm loving you. I'm communing with you. And the only thing that the devil can do right now is watch us eat. Because he was fixated on the Lord. When you fix your eyes on the Lord, my friends, you, there's, there's, there's this ability that God has to, to focus you on everything else and keep you focused solely on him. It's like he guards us. It's like that, that, that uh, thing that they put. It's like a blinder that they put on those racehorses. You ever seen that? It's not like for fashion or anything. You know, they're not like, oh, like, check this cool thing out that I got. No. That thing is there so that they can stay on one track. That's why it exists. So they, they have no vision of anything else. They're not even looking at the horses next to them. All they're doing is they're fixated on the goal. They have a destiny, they have a destination that they are trying to arrive at you. And the Lord wants us sometimes, church, I believe, to just focus our heart, focus our life, focus everything that we are on him and just stare at the beauty and the wondrous awesomeness of the Lord. Because when we stare at that, we don't have time to notice our enemy next to us. Amen? 
When you stare at the goodness of God, when you fixate your life on the light of the Lord, you don't have, you know, the ability to notice that you're surrounded by enemies. David is literally doing this. He's, he's focused on the Lord. He's like, he is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? I have nobody to fear because he is the light of my life. When Stephen was being martyred for his faith in Jesus, the mob of people, they began to stone Stephen with rocks. And in Acts 7, 55, it says this. Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, he looked up to heaven and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Verse 56, he said, look, he said, I see heaven open and the son of man standing at the right hand of God. I believe God's glory was like a shield of protection over David's life, just like it was for Stephen in his last moments here on this earth. The Bible doesn't say, you know, in the next verses when, when they're stoning Stephen, it doesn't say that Stephen is screaming in agony. It doesn't say that Stephen is defending himself. It doesn't say anything. It says that he gave up his spirit and was received by God. You see, when you're focused on Jesus, you don't see what's happening around you. It's, it, it, it's, I, I said it this way one time, but faith has, has no eyes. What does that mean? It, it means that, that it's, we're so intently focused, we're not paying attention to the issue. We have faith to believe in God for something, right? Whether it's healing, whether it's provision, whether it's salvation of loved ones, but we don't see the current thing that we are believing God in faith for as it exists. Amen. We don't see it as it is present. We can look and I can, you can pray for somebody that's blind physically or maybe has cancer in their life, whatever the situation, and we can look beyond that and say, Lord, I am believing that that thing is gone in Jesus' name. That's what faith looks like, amen? That's what looking into the glory of God does to our life. It gives us the ability to see beyond what actually is. Stephen was being pummeled by rocks in the physical Anyone around him would have been like, dude, this guy's literally getting killed. I don't know about you, but getting rocks thrown at you probably is a pretty painful way to die. I can imagine it wasn't slow or it wasn't fast. It was, it was slow. It was, it was painful. He could probably feel one after another, after another, after another. But the Bible doesn't even describe that for us because he looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God. See, if you are going through something right now, if you just look up to heaven and focus on the glory of God, my friend, guess what? All of the pain, all of the things, all of the issues, they just fade away. It's so one thing that I love about prayer, that one thing that I love about worship is when we begin to worship, when we begin to pray, when we step into that holy of holies with the Lord, everything just fades away, church. There's this beautiful immunity, you know, th that you have against the things of this world and the cares of this life when we are just simply bringing ourselves before the Lord. And somebody in this place needs to be reminded that every situation you could ever face in this life will always be inferior to the glory of God. Amen? And finally, the Lord, his love protects us. See, his love is also protective. 1 Corinthians 13 and 7 says this. It says it always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. And it always perseveres. Other translations use that phrase that the love bears all things. The word bears, it means to, to cover all things or to bear up under all things. And so love does both. It stands up under the weight and under the onslaught of things. And it also covers up the faults of others. It covers up the faults of others. It has no pleasure, listen to me carefully, in exposing the wrong and the weaknesses of others, but love bears up under any neglect, abuse, ridicule, or anything that is thrown against it. The love of God, church, will call us out and convict us of sin. Amen? I said the love of God will do that, but it always protects us from shame. 
You see, at the same time that the Lord can, 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 can reveal something about our life that is in, in desperate need of healing, in desperate need of change, transformation, in that very same moment, it will protect us from shame and the condemning thoughts that the enemy would bring our way. And as brothers and sisters in Christ, I have to tell us this tonight. This is exactly the love that he wants us to offer to one another. This is exactly what the Lord is looking for from us. It's okay if we see, you know, you know, maybe our brother or sister, they're doing something wrong and we're there. We're, we can say, hey, you know what, that's not the way we do things, bro. Like, you know, maybe they're new in Christ and, and we're trying to help them along, but, it, but we're not shaming them. We're not condemning them. You see, that's the devil's work. Amen. That's the devil's work. He's the one that shames. He's the one that condemns. He's the one that wants us to feel like we, we, there's no way out. He's the one that wants us to feel isolated from God. And the Lord doesn't do that to us. So why do we do it to others? Why are we sometimes so quick to criticize the sin of another when we have a log in our own? Oh, man, I could see the speck in somebody else's life, but you're ignoring the log in your own. My friends, we cannot live this way any longer. We need to live under the example that Jesus set for us. Amen. And that is we offer love to one another because this is exactly what he has done for us. Think about this for a second. Is not our salvation a rescue from the wrath of God's pending judgment? Oh, yeah. Is not our salvation a rescue from the wrath of God's pending judgment? Is not our relationship with God safeguarding us until we see him face to face? You bet it is. Jesus nailed to the cross is the greatest image of protection. Never forget that. Jesus nailed to the cross is the greatest image of protection because it's Jesus bearing the weight of the judgment of sin so that we did not have to bear the penalty. He is standing in the way. He's in the way as the sacrificial lamb on our behalf so that our inheritance is not hell. So that our inheritance is not torment and the wrath that would come from the Lord. But so that we can receive forgiveness of our sin. All of the shame, all of the burden, everything lifted off of our life and nailed to the cross once and for all. I'm so thankful, church, that Jesus is my defender. Amen. I'm so thankful that Jesus is my protector. I'm so thankful that Jesus is my safeguard. I love this verse in 2 Timothy 4 and 18, and then we'll pray. It says, the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. It says, to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen.